is the, the real troopers who get out the first period on, on Saturday, so thank you. Um, I think most of you know Wally, um, Wally Brooks, and, and, so, and I'm Joyce Meekins from the DC chapter, and I'm, clearly this is Wally's class, I'm a support for this, but I wanted to give you a little background about the, not only Wally's class, but this particular piano right here. Um, this period's in two sessions, and the beginning of the next session, I'll talk more specifically about the 1974 project and how it came about, and about um, some of the background of the area where um, Wally lives at, in terms of piano history. This is not only the story about building a piano, it's really a, a, about the connections and friendships of technicians. Um, to me, Steve Jalen, Frank, and Wally were my, my you know, main stars when I was getting trained too. Particularly Steve Jalen, who was a good friend of my mentor, Wendell Eaton. And I think that was part of the way this idea hatched for the convention piano, because Wendell was institute director in New York in 1974. And so this is a whole other plan here. But um, it is um, the culmination of this piano. One, it was completed at the convention in 74. It was then raffled off. And Ernie Weissenborn from the DC chapter won the piano and he owned it through his lifetime, and it will be going to the museum after this convention. So the family is donating there, so it's awfully kind of a full circle that way. I want to speak a little bit about the people involved in this project, and we'll go with the kid first, Wally Brooks, at that time. But um, in terms of the background, in 1950, Wally, at the age of seven, began working with his dad, Walter Brooks Sr. on vertical pianos, cleaning actions, hooking up bridle straps, etc. And by the time he was 14, he and his dad had worked an arrangement where they would do some reconditioning uprights and split the profits. Um, in 59, Wally joined PTG at the age of 16. <laughs> he graduated two years later, 61, and that was the same year he passed his craftsman exam. So. Um, at that same time, he goes to work with his parents in a new enterprise, Brooks Music Shop, in Connecticut, selling pianos, sheet music, musical instruments, and supplies. And he began refurbishing upright pianos in the basement of Brooks Music Shop. Um, Richard Stoddard joins him part-time in, in the refurbishing business, and they produced about 100 refurbished pianos a year. Next year later, Wally and Vivian married. She just graduated from high school, and you can't talk about Wally without talking about <laughs> Vivian, because this has been a love and a partnership throughout their lives. And then we'll go on, and Vivian up here comes into the business, too. I think you need to see a young Wally Brooks there in 1963. So, oh that's all right. I'll try to do this. So here's Wally. <coughs> And there are other notables in there too, but this is the New Haven chapter at the time. But just consider, of course, everyone attended the suits and ties, just the way I see all of you doing right now. <laughs> but that's the way my mentor too did, and you'll see the butlers at times, Rick particularly, and Dave, I mean, this going to still servicing at you know a very professional dress level. In 1970, the family Brooks Music Shop closes and Wally opens his own rebuilding shop to complement his tuning and repair business and also supplements his income with teaching guitar lessons. He begins a type of apprenticeship with Steve Jellin, being paid in the knowledge that Steve imparts. Uh, for example, replacement of pin blocks and soundboard installation. And this relationship grew into a very close friendship until Steve's death in 1977. I want you to think about throughout all of this how, um, how unusual this was to be doing soundboard work and this level of rebuilding at that time. Um, I was in Wendell's shop at the same, well, in 1975, and what was standard rebuilding was repairing soundboards, shimmying, doing action replacement, but soundboard installation was not the norm at that time, even though people tend to think of it as the norm right now. 
1972, the Connecticut chapter of PTG held their meetings at the Pratt Reef Factory. Can you imagine having your chapter meetings at the <laughs> Pratt Reef Factory? And Wally was always an active member of that chapter, serving in many of its offices, and it was through Connecticut PTG and Pratt Reef connection that Wally made another close friendship with Frank Stopa. Head of Research and Development at Pratt Reef, Jell and Stopa, that was Frank, um, Jellin, Stopa, and Brooks joined together and began consulting on action replacement parts that were then available. And they modified undrilled actions at Pratt Reed for re retrofitting new actions and older pianos. With the help and encouragement from Pratt Reed, Wally grew his knowledge and expertise in the workings of the piano actions. And in the same time, Wally began teaching classes at many chapter, regional, and internal meetings and conventions. Um, and again, from that time point, I remember being with Wendell, and it was um, an innovative thing, a Clemson action parts, where we had a chronic and lock, and it was like parts you couldn't get, and here for the first time, what we consider standard now, being able to get parts that we can then adapt to actions. This was a, a big innovation at that time. 1973 to 78, the rebuilding business grows, and in 1975, Wally built his first soundboard press and begins replacing soundboards on his own, installing more than 480 new soundboard panels over his career. Now, there's so much in this period, but we're, I'm just skimming over it, but I would, um, I, a lot of this is on the Brooks Limited website, the timeline, which is where I got some, but it's worth reading from here on. Brooks Limited is just an incredible company from Wally's connections with people. And in here, Alfred and my son, this was a new tone hammer connection. George Diefenhall would have been the Tokiwa on table hook, as you're probably familiar with some of the later ones. So it came a business group for his own needs that then expanded to something we have access to today. And for an uh, industry that's challenged, I think we have more options as technicians today than we certainly had in the mid-70s. It's pretty extraordinary. Mm -hmm. And a lot of that we need to thank this gentleman for. Going on to his mentor. We'll go back to the older. Now think about Steve Jell in 1917. And the other thing that just, um, I always look at those dates and think, he died at 60. What if he had lived another 20 years? I mean, and what he accomplished in those 60 years is just phenomenal. This um, plaque has a special meaning. It was one that he gave to Wally. You can go on the uh, foundation website under the Steve Jellin Library and read the letter that came with it. But the bottom line is, even someone as great as Steve Jellin can occasionally make a mistake. And it was a wonderful letter that um, Wally wrote and donated this, and it's at hanging in Kansas City. <coughs> Steve got into the piano business partly by chance and partly because it was a trade he could learn for free. So he is not one that came into it at, because his father was in the business. He quit high school in 1933 at the age of 16 and went to work at the Stafford Springs textile mill. Quote, I was always interested in mechanics, he recalls. Once when I saw a tuner working on a neighbor's piano, he took the action of and my eyes popped. I bought an old piano for five dollars and took it apart. <laughs> he stayed at the mill only three years after taking that first piano apart and he quit in 1939. Determined to learn something well enough so that I'd never have to go back, he joined the American Society of Piano Tuners in order to attend its first free seminars on tuning and repairing. He was in that one, not the national. Yep. He memorized piano books, quote, then read them again, and he gradually taught himself cabinet <coughs> making. And I could say more about that than Wally taught, told me in terms of him copying <coughs> books, but we need to keep moving, so. After a four-year stint as an Army medic, Mr. Jellin spent five years as an apprentice in a Springfield, Massachusetts piano shop, and this information is from a Wall Street Journal from 1973, so if there are any corrections, Wally can do that. Um, Steve then learned refinishing, tuning, rebuilding, and repairing, and he scrimped and saved to attend every um, guild, or it would have been then the, um, the ASPT seminar that he could. As far as way as Chicago and Detroit, and quote, I remember times when I couldn't see it, recalls his wife Jeanette, but he'd go to the seminars anyway and he'd say, if I learned one thing, it was worth it. 
sound familiar? I mean, 1951, Steve opens his own shop in his parents' house here, meaning in, in um, Stafford Springs. And four years later, he's four years later, he starts building his first piano. Not rebuilding, building his first piano. A task that took him two years. He got a big assist from the former Pratt Reed consultant, the late Charles Frederick Stein, who was then near legendary figure within the piano building circles. Charlie helped me with the blueprint, says Mr. Jellin, but I actually made the first one because he wanted to be sure I was serious about learning the trade. He was serious enough to invest $7,000 in designing and building the tools that he needed for this new trade. And here we see some of the Pratt Reed. So here's Steve. passed away in 1977, and he had been a consultant to Pratt Reed, and they needed to find someone to fill his role as consultant. So they turned to Wally, Steve's protege. As part of his Wally's education for this role, he built his own piano in his shop starting in 1978. Wally had worked on numerous projects with Steve, but now he wasn't building a Jellin piano, he was building a Brooks piano. While he photographed each phase of construction and he developed a class given many times at the convention and we're pleased that he's returned to give an encore presentation of this class today. And um, the photos you will see in this is, are not the building of this piano but the building of the Brooks piano. And last but certainly not least was a dear man named Frank Stoppa. He was a company man, he was a career man and this is something you need to think about with Pratt Reed, much like you read about Steinway, where a town revolves around a business. Piano building was an industry, one of the top industries in this region. So in his career, Frank had spent more than 40 years at Pratt Reed, and he was an engineer in research and design, and his work left volumes of careful records of research and testing. After his retirement from Pratt Reed, he continued piano work at his home primarily, but not exclusively in key work. And I think that's how those of us who've been in it for a long time remember Frank during that time. Um, he made himself available to technicians not only in Connecticut but across the country. Frank was a family man and he was a company man. There was an article written in 1998 by Claudia Van Ness and it was dealing with Ivoryton and that area and the ivory trade but it also focused on Frank. And in her article she says, Frank may be the last person left with the know-how to build a piano keyboard with ivory keys. And lately, Frank, 28, has pretty much stopped taking orders for new keyboards or even repairs of existing ones unless someone calls. The Ivoryton section of Essex and the neighboring town of Deep River were once the manufacturing center of the world for products made of ivory, most especially keys for the pianos that every Victorian family wanted in their parlor. When the piano became a must-have piece of furniture, the business really took off. And according to economists who were interviewed for a piece, um, what, at one point, 12,000 pounds of ivory were cut in one month at Pratt Reed in Deep River. So Pratt Reed started with ivory before it got into action parts. Stopa, whose father worked at Pratt Reed, remembers the tusks coming by train through the center of Ivoryton and Deep River when he was a boy. He says you can still see the marks of the tracks in Main Street in Ivoryton as you walk past the Copper Beach Inn, once the grand home of ivory magnet A.W. Comstock. Stopa followed his dad into the shop at the end of the 1930s, and he went on to become a foreman and to work in every department until Pratt Reed, which had merged with Comstock Cheney and consolidated operations in Ivoryton and closed down about a decade later. I was told by one person that if anyone in a de department in Pratt Reed either quit or couldn't be there, they could get Frank in and he could just jump in and knew, could 
could do any aspect of that work. The plant had long since replaced ivory with plastic because of the ban on, on the elephant um, um, killings. But a stockpile of ivory remained, and Stoker bought up much of it along with some of the cutting machinery. The Pratt Reed records are now at the Smithsonian and, and also in the archive section of PTGF. Um, dot org, the foundation website. You can read the memoirs of Edith Mary DeForest, who worked at Pratt Reed for 45 years. These were written memoirs are available thanks to Vivian Brooks, who transcribed the original tapes by Edith. Vivian, and all these connections, Vivian had her own connection to Pratt Reed. Her grandfather had worked there, and it was his verification of employment that allowed Vivian's British mother and her to come to the United States from England. And the last slide is just to show the recognition of not only these wonderful technicians, but people devoted to our organization. I think all three of them were the type of people that rarely ever said no. Um, you asked them to do something and gave a um, tremendous amount of their time and helped to support people. So that is the end of my section. And now you get to the part you came for. <laughs> Stephen Franklin, my mentor, you know, and, uh, well, they were probably, Steve, would, I, I'm trying to remember how, how much difference there is in age, but when I joined, you saw I was at 16 years old. By the time I'm 19 or 20, and even when I'm still 20, they were the youngest people in all the chapters and in the whole guild that I could relate to. They were like in their 40s. Uh, they'd be like George Diefenbaugh, it's the same thing. You know, when people wonder how I connected up to that. And they uh, well, took me under my wing, under their wings, and I got the free ride here to, to learn what happened with the, the models and everything. We had to teach in a lot different way. We didn't all have fancy slide equipment or cameras. And, and we, you know, there was there were slides out there, but it was, you know, it's so expensive for a piano tuner to do slides, but the first few slides you're going to see in here were done with a brownie camera. You get 12 shots. You can't screw up and there's no delete. <laughs> you had to pay to have all 12 shots, and you might not even have 12 shots, but one shot out of it that you could use. Okay? That, that, that's the real world. On top of that, I mean, automatically, any of you have done a slide, I see David over there and a few other people. First of all, you gotta take about 100 slides to get 20. Okay, you have a sorting board. That's before we had the delete, you know, before it went digital. Um, and that means you had to set up for all of this and stop what you were doing, go take the shots, so all of this, everybody was putting time in. So back then, this is more how we did. We got up and talked about it. All we had to do hands-on. And hands-on was cool. I can remember doing one in Philadelphia, you know, for four or five days with 20 people. And it was so good, but it was so bad because you weren't getting to very many people. If you can understand what I mean. We just learned ways that we could teach and pass information to people that, that would be much faster. So. The uh, little parts that you see here, these are the actual tools that you need to build a little piano. So, I mean, a vertical piano. The vertical piano we're going to build is a standard upright piano with five or six posts put together exactly the same way as a big one. So that you basically. Now, the other thing is, if you can walk through a factory in a vertical piano factory that's making a vertical line, you won't even understand what's going on because of the machinery that's making it, but here you're gonna see each part of it, okay, as it's made. Uh, hopefully everybody goes home with one thing. Is that what we do? That's, right. That's all I have to worry about happening? <laughs> uh, I'm gonna be sitting down most of the time because I can't stand up. I can walk a ways, but I can't stand for any length of time to be in front of you. And so if you don't mind, I'm gonna sit over here and, and we'll go 
it's about a three hour class. We've cut it to about two and a half. It's not really a class on how to do it. It's how it's done. Is there a difference? Okay. And hopefully we'll all get something out of this. Uh, this part one and part two, I don't know if they'll go happen to change at the break or what, but I'm going to try and move it along to, to get it to fall that way because Joyce has got another little part for you in, in the second half, okay? The first half is about building the back of the piano, soundboard, pin blocks, and all of that and making them and putting them together. The second class is, is how to actually build an action for it and we made the set of keys in front of you too, the whole thing, the, the keys were made because that was all part of what this was about. The plate was given to me and some of the parts were given, all the parts were any, I didn't have to pay for anything, from Pratt & Reed, Bowley Brooks Education Fund. And all I'm doing is trying to continue the education fund, okay? To everybody get something out of it. So that's kind of where we are with it. So let me get used to this. Right. That's Steve. I think you can see that down in the booklet that flips, right? Am I going right? I think yeah. So. This is a, a, a beginning, okay? I did have a drawing of a, of, 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 of a blueprint for this, okay? Charles Frederick Stein, and it's a Charles Frederick Stein plate and piano, okay? Charles Frederick Stein was a piano designer up in, uh, in Chicago originally, and, and he did a little bit of a pop in, in the Milwaukee area, uh, but he had a shop in downtown, almost in downtown, I believe, uh, Chicago, and he also made some small grand pianos, very, very good quality. Some of them, ah, uh, he used to have this violin bridge, one of those bridges that might have been about yay high or something, but, but his basic piano, you know, they, they were pretty good quality, anything, a real good woodworker and designer. Then he could sell like this upright piano, which is the 40 inch console that's around. And you'll see it when you're tuning the piano designed by, by Fred Charles Frederick Stein as a piece of junk. Because they'd all, do, it, it, you know, we got into the 70s when a lot of those pianos were still being made, especially the junk 60s, 70s. The end of that was to see how you could make it cheaper. So all of a sudden, six pages. Uh, post came down to three post or no post or in the back, that kind of stuff, okay? Everybody got the picture. Uh, and they and they'd also, you know, get them going down the line. You have to realize that in Ball and Hackersonic takes 16 minutes to make. I'm talking beginning to end. Wow. That's how much time, or 16 hours, I'm sorry. I don't do this anymore, and I always kept telling Joyce I was going to tell a, a little thing. Wendell, Wendell her, her mentor, told me one of the best compliments I ever had. I was probably 35 years old or less, and I was doing a seminar down in Washington, D.C. at one of the big hotels, and we won't go seminar, though, probably. And, and Wendell introduced me, you know, to everybody, and I thought that, boy, this is a cat me out, first of all, to get introduced by Wendell, because he didn't hand out compliments real fast. But he told, he, he, he told everybody that, that, they, he had brought, uh, that they had brought me down to do this class because I forgot more than most any of them knew, ever knew out there. Well, I forgot more now, and you guys know a lot more than me, so you'll have to remind me of words whenever I fall into my I cover my spell, I cover my butt, you know, a second. Okay, anyhow, what we have to do is come up with a way to build a foundation, and the foundation of an upright piano is the back of the piano. Uh, it has to be square, solid, carry all the pressure and, and so forth. Does everybody have an idea of that? And a press looks something like this, that, and I'll pass this around. Um, I think you're going to see it. Maybe after it comes back, I'll take it apart, okay? Uh, but you can still look it over if we keep it tight. And all these pieces are loose in here. But basically, we have to glue this all together. And we're gluing the pin block down at the same time as the back. And I'm going to show you all the pieces quickly in a second. The posts that are in here, 
okay? And, and we have some space of blocks growing in, but we have to glue all of this up and then we have to be able to plant. I don't know, everything. Everybody got, I got it, Joy. Okay, we have to plant down on everything and we also have to have some kind of pressure coming this way. The actual press that we're gonna go put it in is gonna almost pressure bone to what is done with fire hose. And these are our uh, I beams or H beams, I guess we would we call it, because everybody following me is very, very strong. But it's two big tubes like this and that. So that had to be made, okay? Yeah, you can pass it around. Try not to turn too many screws or so it all falls out. Okay, let's see if we can put this together at the back anyway. Okay, now you can see the press, if you can see the, the, the press to put it together where those screws are, the metal screws, they were threaded wooden screw, uh, screws. Steve had a whole set which I ended up with, I think Amy, uh, most many of you would know Amy Banovich. Amy, does she go by that? Yeah. She has to now. But we could thread all different sizes of, of uh, of those wood threads and, and, and do all kinds of things like that. Um, okay, in on here, these are the parts of a back of a press, okay, and I'm going to try to remember them. And, and, and Joyce will have to help me because I told her once, but I told her I forget. Okay, these are the outside posts here, okay. These are called plates, the ones that run along and back at the pin block, and, and this would be down at the foot pedal's side, okay? They're plates, the long one, okay? Posts, spacer blocks, they call them. So the other thing that you had to do with the press, and this is just jumping to it, is we had to make the pin blocks, okay? And they were just clamped together. We, we, most of this pin block stuff was all bought. It was paneled. Does everybody know what I mean? Each, each, each lamination, in other words, I think there's five or, or three and a big fat one in the pin block that we made for these. Um, I mean, and it's all quarter saw maple. It was all cut and paneled together so that, in other words, it's not just one long strip of maple. But the ones that go this way, yeah. Just one question on that last slide. Those those joints, um, were they typically lap joints between the post and, and the post? Yeah. Okay. They typically lap joints. They lap joints. joints on the post. Yeah, they just they just butt joints. Okay. Yeah. They, <coughs> they don't. Some of them, they don't all over, overlap. No. Sometimes on old ones I see them sprung. Yeah. The the one in the back on the post does. Okay. Meaning. Down in here, it's, see how it's wider in the back? That's what you meant, right? Yeah, yeah. Or well, Earl was asking anyway, but that, that, yeah, that's, that's a change right there. Anyhow, we were actually making two pit blocks here, okay? They were laminated, get, all made by North Hudson Woodcraft up in Dolgeville, New York, okay? Very famous little town that we don't know of, you know, or, or some of you don't. But Alfred Dole was there, he built all the hammer presses and all that kind of stuff. Uh, and, and it's out in the movies, it's up in the Adirondacks. So they, it would, it would be hard maple that grew, grew in the mountains, uh, not soft maple, okay? Uh, and it would all be quarter sawn. And then they also would make all those back posts were cut for them. Meaning all those posts that you saw, these pieces were all pre-cut, okay? And that's all spruce. Outer on it's white spruce, it's really a red spruce. Those are single pieces too, not laminated, right? The, the posts are single pieces, not laminated, right? They're solid. They're single pieces, not laminated. They're, they're not laminated. No lamination in this, okay? Uh, no, the lamination is gonna be in, in, the, uh, in the pin block, okay? Right. See how this tube there actually, you know, you can 
see it framed right here, but we're planning to get it. This is a card, but those are just calls, what's called okay, for a name anyway. Okay. Okay, and then we glue it together. You know, we used all plastic resin glue or almost everything, formaldehyde glue. There's people that might had to have pianos, you know, that couldn't have any formaldehyde in them, but all the furniture was put together with that. Very waterproof. Takes a lot of pressure to build it. These are the uh, metal that I told you that was that made up for that wooden part that came around. Pretty soon. Now these, these are all brownie shops, don't forget. For, um, right here, and then you'll see it change. I finally, after that, got enough. I didn't have enough money, you know. I started with 35 bucks when I closed the music store, and uh, that's what we built it from. And, and so after I got, you know, got some things going, I took and I, I bought a 35 millimeter camera. Nothing like your phone, because it wasn't automatic or anything. You had to go learn about photography and how to set up f-stops and all of that stuff and light stops. Now that might be 35 millimeter right now. Still a film though. Okay, I, I think you can see how it was all pressed together. Uh, pressed from here and now we're up to here. We got all the names so we can keep going. Okay, the next thing we have to do is make a press or make a, a soundboard. Um, very similar to this, and you can see the go bar press that we made here. I had a go bar press, go, go bar press also. Uh, and it's going to be pressed on a, a belly board that's down here. It has a curve in it, hollowed out like the inside of an orange. Let me put it that way, okay? And it's, it, except it's not round like an orange. <laughs> well, how can you have a curve that's not round? <laughs> Natural curve. What's the name of it, David? Kind of curve is. Okay. If you took a piece of stick and you bent it, that's the curve, and that's how you bend it. And my belly board happens to be made. It's 55 inches. You have to have, to have a stick you make. I don't see one laying there. But there is a stick. It's called a straight edge stick or a curved straight edge. Okay. And it's got the one that goes this way. And then on the, you know, it's about this wide. Is everybody following me? And the bottom one's the same curve, going inside and then outside. Okay, does everybody follow? But the curve was actually made. If I wanted to make a quarter inch curve in this, I'd put a nail here in the middle and bend it down a quarter inch, and then I'd just draw a line, and that's the curve I got to make everything. <laughs> Still, if you're going to build a piano, you have to be very, very careful with moisture content to wood and controlling the wood. So you had to have what we call a hot box, or it's really a little kiln of some sort to control the wood. And the wood all had to be in the, in the soundboard. We actually, before we heard it was bang, we brought it down to about less than four percent relative humidity or moisture content in the wood. Uh, almost a three just before it was glued. But if anything in all kind of the wood that goes into the uh, piano and any kind of furniture in this country was always brought to six percent with, with what we, some, some things are set up at eight. The reason we had a lot of trouble with pianos that came over, early pianos from Europe and everything, their, their moisture content only ever had to be brought to 12 percent, which is like lumber that we build our houses with. Even if it was kiln drive or drive, but that, that's, the, that's where they only work from. Is that at, back in the early times when those were built, they didn't have the 
they had a lot of houses and everything, but they worked with the idea they didn't have real strong uh, central heating systems that dried the houses out like we have, and they didn't run into that. And they didn't also, the countries were very small and they didn't cover as big an area, uh, meaning as, as, as bigger an environmental area that changes them. Anyhow, that was a little neat moisture meter thing. You stick a couple probes in there, run some electricity through it, and it would tell us what the moisture content of the wood was. Okay, a little block, just like you can see in this press. I'm not going to pass it, but maybe I can. You know. Anyway, a go box that runs like like this, and and I can remember. I think I had 160 go box. No. But I, the 160, I had 100 go bars, but each one of them was measured so that it pushed down 160 pounds. And how do you make that? You know, we had fancy things to do here. So you took and you cut them to a size that was thing, and they're all hickory sticks, so that the memory goes back. And we take them, we make them with a bend, we push them in just like pushing on here. Except we had a bathroom scale on the here. So you took and you did that and you made them and they come close, but because of the grain and then everything was different. So you push it on the bathroom scale and, until it, it started out and then you'd have to bring it over. I had a big belt of uh, sander on my uh, table saw with a sanding wheel, you know, and we'd sand it off until we got down to somewhere. And then I have a mark. We had different colors painted loops around them that went from 145 to 165 uh, in five degrees something and, 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 and to get an idea where I wanted to put them a little or something. <laughs> but very important to have real good contact on the ends of anything because okay you gotta clamp everything down. So you gotta you know you sit here and think about a hundred boards, a, a hundred sticks going 160 pounds. You add that up, and that's why you see such a massive thing. A couple ton, I guess. Fun. A couple Cadillacs. I didn't put in uh, Grand Sound, made for Grand Sound boards. This wasn't like the first thing that I ever done. I don't know, it was probably the first upright, but it might not even have been the first upright that I did. I think I did a sideway upright one time. Uh, sound board. But you can actually see, this, see the curve making up that we talked about. Uh, kind of shoot, if you shoot down it in that picture, it's not too bad for one. Seventy-four, 
and I don't know how many times I gave this class, and you know, I carried these around with me. And uh, then we actually had them in the museum. You could just pass them around, yeah. Because this board that's in her left hand, this one here, you can see this, I could just set that on there and I could, you know, knew where I wanted to put the ribs, too. Um, yeah, 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 we, we're just gonna do this. We're, we're gonna pass this around at the same time. And this is actually, because the soundboard, after it has, has ribs on it, I'm not gonna, Okay, it goes on this, and, and, and when you're building a wheat, when you can sound boards like for a replacement, you kind of question. Yeah, did you ever have to go for a split? Sometimes I've had a bit work and it was just like an arrow. Snap, yeah. Yeah. And that's where you have to be careful. Yeah. And you keep your eyes away from them. Yeah, they were a little dangerous. Is fiberglass better to use? What? Is fiberglass be better to use? Yeah, probably, but you know, you could, yeah. <laughs> I don't know if it have a return on it. That's one of the things with the hickory. That's true. Meaning it has a memory, and if you go set it overnight, by overnight, it's back fairly straight. That's true. Still have some curve, but it yeah. won't have that. You can make them out of oak. You can make them. I used to make them out of pine or anything. If I was like putting bridges in a soundboard in a brand, I had a post that wasn't too tall. It was carrying the building, right, right. so I could just go over there and. Throw a few, make some go bys that will stick down. I don't care if they I didn't. suppose if you soak them in like linseed oil or something, you can maybe preserve them better than spray. Yeah. Okay. If, if, when we're doing soundboards for a stein, for, a, for a, a grand piano, although we had duck boards, and they, these boards would look like this, uh, like each one of these, though, so that we could slide them because each pian piano might be different. This is for production, you could actually remake, remake it. Uh, the same uh, same soundboard over and over. Okay, but they actually have a curve this way, and they have a curve this way. Does everybody follow that? Yeah. yeah so it was a little tricky actually making them. Um, yeah. This is a liner. It's called that piece that's on the bottom, okay? Uh, that, that's called a liner because on the next picture there is one being blue in coming down the sides here. Uh, I don't have to give you the. It's going to go a little tricky, isn't it? Yeah, right here. Okay, now you've got a liner in this one that goes across here. They are also got this curve in it. The two-way curve, everything's got that little curve so that everything's going to go back and mate, okay? Nothing's going to be pulled and unnatural. That was kind of why that curve that we built into it is natural, because wood doesn't like being bent unnaturally. Kind of like the curve in a grand piano, that curve is actually natural. And how many Steinway animals the bridge comes off at the end? That's because that's unnatural. I think that's a good one to pick on, right, David? Because every one of them is going to have a loose bridge at the end, and that has to do with that band. Uh, okay, and then we have to stop thinking about making a bridge. This is class for 930. I, I might have to sort of uh, tell a story. <laughs> All right, well, uh, the bridge is just actually a solid piece of, of quarter sawn maple, okay? Uh, and it was, that was a relief on putting up in the, for the treble end. It doesn't look like, yeah, it's the back of the treble, I guess, huh? Or some part of it, anyway. I was putting a relief in it. Okay, and then that's put in a jig, and this is to actually put the curve in the bot. That's upside down. The bridge is in there upside down because that's to fit across this curved soundboard that goes every which way. 
the, in, in reality, because the bridge is long and the bridge basically goes on the longest grain in the soundboard. Does everybody follow that? That long bridge does? That's, that, this is called the long bridge. The base bridge is called a short bridge, okay? It's not a thing. Uh, so you cut the concave on there. Anyway, this, this, uh, this is like, it's like a little strip out of the, the, the belly board that was done like this, so that when I go around it, it actually has a, the bridge has a little thing like a, it goes up and once it gets a little higher over here or it's back and then it gets down and goes below, so that it fits again, all as a fit thing. Quarter sawn maple is what I called it, right? And then we had the back spruce. So you ever hear of quarter saw maple and then you heard of vertically sawn wood? Do you know what the difference is? Somebody tell me. No. Well, it's a total thing. If you're going to go out and buy wood, you have to kind of know what to do to buy this kind of wood because it's sort of spent also if you want to pick it. But if you're going to go talk to the lumber man, it's, there's two different things. They're exactly the same thing. The grain is basically ends up vertical or yeah. off at one o'clock or eleven o'clock or whatever you talk. Okay? But basically hardwoods they have their quarter song and, and talking and, and, and softwoods are a uh, 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 vertical song. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's the only uh -huh. difference. You just have to tell them so don't get confused with that. Uh, and that back caused the screws so that that's all white on the anaerobic screws. Which Get you confused, it's really called a red spruce tree they got it from. Well, after we got the soundboard down, I don't think the soundboard is glued down yet or anything. I know, I can see it, that it's not. But it's in place, and it's also, someplace here has a pin in it, so that it goes back to the same place every time. Does everybody follow me? Okay, and I think it's a bridge pin to make sure that it's mating and they call mating pins. Okay, now, there's, a, there's a, another pin that we're doing because this is the first time we put the plate on it. Somewhere along here, you ever be tuning the piano and all of a sudden you see the back of something that looks like a tuning pin coming back out at you? Those are mating pins also because that's mating when the, when the plate's going in so that it goes in and out because it has to be taken in and out no matter how. When you're building a piano, it has to be put in and out a few times. It has to go back to the same place every time. So we'll, we'll kind of see that when you, you I, I think you'll understand, but it, there's got to be one in here right this minute. There it is. There it is, yeah. It's uh, right here, see it? Okay. And there's one across on the other end. Now, what we're looking at here, this is the scale of a piano, not changing the wire size that people come up with, oh, I'm going to change the scale. If you're going to change the scale, you've got to do a lot more than that. Okay? This is the actual boards that make the scale of the design for the piano. And it tells you all the lengths of the strings on this part. It's only that part of it, okay? So where the bridge is going to fall, and it also it takes an uh, tells us a couple things on this short one anyway. Okay, this one here. I'm not sure. It should be one that goes to the third tuning pin. Okay. Looks like the and then this is the B bar. We might get some other pictures of this more. These are the bridge pins. Does everybody follow them? Are they falling? Okay, so I have put that bridge on and set all, I think there were six of them. Maybe it was five uh, of these scale sticks, and they would stretch out, but they all had to match up, and I had to make sure that the, the uh, bridge pins or markings were going to land on the bridge. Does that make sense? <laughs> so you're locating the bridge there? Yeah, I'm locating where the bridge is going to go. So of course, once I got it in place, I probably just put a little pencil mark or something so I could put it back there, and then I would take a and put some probably bridge pins, or small bridge pins with a little sharp point on them, or a nail. 
and then I put it back between the thing and push it down, and then that would go there from then on. Because everybody got an idea, so that I would mark it that way. Let's see what happens next. Oops, you already did that, didn't you? See, I, I had this wonderful woman that worked for me here. She even put your little arrow there to show you that bridge again. Yeah, that helps you. Okay, it was, you know, the tuning pen is what I told you, but went from a tuning pen. And actually, I'm building a, and this is a scale C, and then this scale G's. That part, this part of it's always the same, and, and the different scale letters, and that has to, but it has to do with where the back is, more than anything, how many posts are in it, and so forth, and it has to do that with the plate. Okay, after we know where the bridges are, then, then they get glued down to uh, Underneath, that's that board I send around that I call the duck board, that set, okay? Uh, that's so we don't take the curve out of the soundboard. We have to still clamp it down quite tight. Okay, after we have the uh, bridges on, I always style them, but we also take them and, and screw them with buttons also in between. Uh, a lot of people, you know, use screws, the dowels, of course, are the fastest, and they, you know, somebody in the market would say is some kind of acoustic, acoustic dowel or something like that. They just try to hold the thing together. Where did you acquire the plate? The plate was given to me by Pratt Reed. Pratt Reed? And, yeah. Pratt Reed donated that and all the stuff to the back. No, maybe I, some of the back post and all that. The stuff came from Steve, I'm not sure, but the plate came from Donated. That was part of the Wally Brooks education fund. So the plate was in another current production piano and some other factory? Uh, the plate was in uh, there, there was a whole floor. Charles Frederick Stein worked for Pratt and Reed after he closed during the war 42. Yeah. And, then, and then, they, then he went to Pratt and Reed. And he's the one that actually designed the compressed action. I mean, it, it's not the greatest action, but it, it's the best one out there actually in a small piano that, you know, it's very little touchy. I mean, it doesn't have a lot of parameters. If you took the bigger, you need to design some of the bigger action. But a little bigger action, you know, it can be off farther and still work. I saw recently a strung back, occasional CDs for sale, sometimes got a strung, a strung cast on your plate for sale. Yeah. I was thinking of an interesting foundation for class to build a piano around the bridge. Yeah, let me, let me explain the plate because we did kind of pass through it. Of course, it's cast iron. I only, I can say I've been through two plate companies, but these, the plate that I got has actually was made at Badger in Milwaukee. And then that company burnt down. Now, somebody might have to help me with the name. Wickham was one of them. Kelly Wickham. Okay, got him down in, in Ohio. And Kelly. I went to the other one, Kelly. That was that's probably the hardest working people that build stuff for the piano industry. Let me tell you, those people with them wood and that hot metal floating around in these great big vats and it smells and other than the smelly part of making wool, that that wool wool fat you know, that's a horror show too. <laughs> there's a there's a foundry up in Pennsylvania now, they have they do production work, but they also do custom work, and they now have a, basically, it's, a, it's like a 3D printer. Okay, what it does is it I does, bet you they have that stuff. Now. Yeah, it's, it's amazing. They can, they can take a pattern, like, over, over the internet or whatever. They stick it in this machine, and so it 3D prints the same, so you don't and have to they can make they, they can take and make a 3D, because what you have to do to get this plate, we should stay with plate. We could take and pass this around and make it some feeling of it after I explain. But you have to do to make that plate. If I wanted it to come out this size, I have to make a double shrink pattern, yeah. which is made on a double shrink. It'll say 36 inches, but it's really almost 37 inches. Okay? And you do all the drawings with that, and all the drawings, because now what I got to make is a wooden pattern. I have to put that in and make another pattern, pattern, a metal pattern, if I'm going to continue to make it. You could probably make five or six of them from the wood right. pattern. I just want to make a point that actually uh, behind our booth right now, although it is 
not an upright. There is a wooden pattern from the solar factory that belongs to Sean for, for a brand plate. So just by talking that about that. That kind of stuff, you'll uh, see that. Okay, okay, that's the wooden one, okay? So that got shrunk. Now the wooden pattern made. So now you're taking, you, you make a, a real metal pattern for production. So that's going to shrink, right? Now from the metal pattern, it goes into a pile of sand. Put it back, that's the old style. The old style was a sand sand mold that, was, that, it, that it went into. Well, this new one is still sand. What they do is they, they 3D print sand. It's like a inkjet print. I understand, but we're not building a new pan. Right, I'm out. Yeah, and we're running short on time, too, yeah. if you don't mind. Yeah. Uh, so what happened is, it, it, is now we put it in and, and we have to make another one. So the final plate is a double shrink. Does everybody follow me? Okay, and, and, that, and it has to have reliefs in it. That's why the shape of, of, of like the braces and everything come out at a, at a little angle so that we could take this back out and, and also take the plate when it gets done. I think it's seven minutes to make a plate when I was there, and I no doubt can make it faster than that now. But it used to be a, a big, huge room, size of what the gymnasium, maybe bigger, doubles that size. And they used to, it would be all on this overhead, and they get all this molten metal, all. they have a thing that made a cope and a drag, it's called, okay, and a sand cast it, and they come up and they fill them, and they go all the way around, and it was all on a moving belt. <laughs> they came around and do it. Yeah, it was like they spent nothing seven minutes before they took it back out and got it cool. Then let it cool. It was hot, but it was hard at that point. Enough about plates. We have an idea. Lacquer, that's what I use for everything. Okay, we have to square that back though somehow, make it come out relatively square. Okay, and, and, and to do that, we have to get one side square, okay? Because we didn't have, you know, if you go to the factory now, you're gonna see a computer go around and zoom, zoom, zoom with a laser on it or a CNC machine that's gonna set up and cut it. They probably even have them more modern than that. I, I, I couldn't believe one of the, you know, I've been through a lot of factories and, and they were just kind of stopping with a lot of that, uh, I, I guess what we call it, See, the see automatic it. machine, you know, I mean, yeah, but, you know, I went on a trip with my wife down to Rye or something, but one of the best things I ever did is I went to the Mercedes factory. It was absolutely unbelievable to watch this. All the stuff got, they didn't own anything until the morning. They went into the car that was coming out in the afternoon. And they had all these supplies, they didn't have to buy them yet. They'd all showed up in the front, in the front of the yard. It was all in a computer, all the way down to every screw nut, the tires that were going on it, and everything. Okay? Somehow that all came together. It didn't follow it all the time, but it all came together at the end. And you could go into huge rooms as big as the biggest ballroom where I have two people working in it, and these cars flying around. And one time, about three people got out and did some hand work. It was absolutely unreal how, how, how much you know, automation to it. And they you build them in a day. That's, you know, that's, you know, they build a car like that. That's why, you know, they didn't actually build a piano. It wasn't very many hours that they built them. Yeah. I don't know how far they get them down like now. It's unreal. Okay, we're going to square one side. Okay, and then from that side, I can use a square to bring it up, and this has got, those are just tracks so that I can take and square the top of the piano so that I can run around it across the square. Everybody following me? All right, and then all right. And of course, it keeps going around the other sides, okay? Uh, not with a saw, not with a thing. I had to do it by making a lot of sawdust. Mm -hmm. The project started probably when I was in 1978, maybe, maybe a little bit before. And I would work on it, and then it would get left for a month or something. Finally, or a month or two months, I wouldn't, and then I'd get a little bit more done. Finally, at, at, towards the end, for the last while, I took and I uh, 
decided that every Monday, I think it was, or one day a week, whatever it was, that's what I did is I worked on the piano project. And, you know, it was kind of fun, but it's also, you know, if you don't have money, and the kids probably at that point in time probably were growing up and costing money, and you're not tuning pianos, and you're not making money on it, or doing anything like that, it was all for learning. So we did get it done in a couple of years. How long would it take me to make it? Uh, two weeks, if I got right after it. Not now. Now it'd be three years. <laughs> what I used to do in an hour, it takes me all day, and that means I'm tired in the afternoon, so it's the next day, too, before I make it. <laughs> Somebody came up to me and asked me about, well, what did you have an address on it? Did the back get pulled apart? Clearly, of course, I was a piano pan person. And, and you always find these pianos with the soundboard or the thin block pulled away and the back pulled away. So, Wally did it. <laughs> so, and I wonder sometimes if some sucker's going to have to try to pull this apart. <laughs> okay? We'll take it away. Put the screws in, but I put screws right in and they went all the way, those screws go almost all the way through underneath the plate. The other one's uh, right here, that's where the plate screws are going to go. This is done with, there's no plate holes or screws or pins, okay? A little extra. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, now once we have the plate, we can screw it down, which that one doesn't look like it is, but it might be, it might have to have been cranked down or whatever. So we're going to set the down barrel in the bridges, and with a piece of string go through, and uh, with a saw or something, just keep cutting until I got the right tilt to the bridges, uh, and I got the right down barrel, and then what I'm looking for. Then we plane the bridges off. You can see the uh, saw marks in the end. I always mix my own graph. I never bought that drag. It was just nice and black. It was actually with uh, Nickerson black alcohol stain and uh, and graphite, powdered graphite. I put that on, and then you put it on. Anytime you put graphite on anything, it's how much can you take back off. Yeah. Okay, and you, you got you, you know I'm using a little electric brush to stop it. Uh, there's other ways to shine it up. You know, you still you, you can take a beer bottle and put it on the side and drag it down, and you get a nice glassy finish. <laughs> it, after you get most of it off, you just got to make sure you don't get the seam caught up. <laughs> Meaning the steam to the beer bottle. <laughs> Where'd you get the beer bottle, Molly? <laughs> I'd have to go to my, I have a judge friend that drinks a lot of beer. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think, all right, if you went to David's classes on bridges, he's probably using a nylon or something that he's using to copy it. But if it's in a factory, and they gave me these, so I didn't. You know, this came with my kit or something. But you can pass one around. That's kind of what would be used in the factory to bind it. It's some kind of zinc. It's kind of a sheet metal, but it's very soft. And I don't know if you know what it's made out of, but it already had all that bridge pattern in there. It wasn't something I saw. They mark all the things, uh, holes, and I would say I drilled them here someplace, but 
needing those vice grips in that day on both sides to get a hold of the pins, to get them out, plug all of that up and, and, and take a chunk off, okay? You got to fix it. It costs a lot of work, so you don't go to sleep enough to do it. <laughs> Starting to look like a piano work that you see. Okay, yeah. well, so we got a back of the piano. And I think I think there was a good picture of that. We we can see a lot of things, like the way the pin block is really part of it, okay? The pin block is really three ply. This is quarter saw and maple, it might not even be quarter saw and maple to be truthful. It's hard rock maple, but it's kind of a back part of the pin block. And that would be a typical thing you'd find in a thing. You don't end up with a five ply block like you have in a grand piano and, a, and an upright. Uh, the posting is almost completely of a, of a, basically if I called it a standard upright, how they were put together. I'm not sure if Joyce was in, if you don't know each part of the class, you know, but you know, I told her, and I won't take all her fire apart, I said something the other day when I was, she was there, of how, if just from my house, building these little pianos like this, we had, we had places, you know, probably between my, I said to her, between my house and New Haven, 45 miles, there were probably 30 piano companies. Little piano companies. Some of you guys are old enough to remember television shops yeah. in the 50s, okay? Or even the 60s, right? They used to have to be repair place on every corner. Well, that's what the heck they had with pianos, you know? Uh, they were all, in New England especially, I don't know, what kind of numbers did you go up to? Yeah, um, that's how I had session when I looked she's gonna, she's, gonna, <laughs> she's gonna give you a little bit on that, I think. Is that what yeah. you're going to Of course, a lot of those pianos were kits. Uh, and they do that in Europe a lot still, you know. They have these kits almost that you can buy, and they, the way you put your name on it, the deal it can, it really takes it a lot of work out of it or something. And you find all of these, uh, these not decal pianos, what do you call them? Stencil pianos. Stencil? Stencil pianos, right. And it, it really is probably some kid's grandson or something. Guys, the deal or something, right? Even Baldwin did that. With, what was that name? Howard. Howard, yeah. Howard yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah, something like that. Okay, we got to here, we're going to move because we still got a lot of work to do. After we do this, you can see those long screws I put in there. That's too cold. Like these? <laughs> it hasn't fallen apart yet. Clean up the V bar. Mark, because these are drilled by hand, believe it or not, you can read it. You know, I didn't, that's what the biggest drill I had. <laughs> Maybe not the biggest, but I didn't have a drill press, big radial on to go over or anything. Uh, but when I marked those, they were actually tilted so that they start up a little high, meaning that's little, got a little tin on the bottom of it that's going to make a mark, does everybody know? And so I didn't want it right in the center, I wanted it to the high side, so that when it's loaded, you're clearing plates and stuff. So those are marked by that way, and then drilled by hand. And that's a little quarter inch drill that's going to do this. It looks like, basically though, what you did is quarter inch is what we actually drilled them at, 250s, okay? But we'd actually drill it by, by, there might be a drill at 230, 236, I think, or some reason I want to call it the one below that. So we drill it out by hand just by holding the angle, okay? And then the next thing we do is then we take 250 in one time, you know, because you'd have to woodpecker it to get in there with that little drill like that. Meaning you'd have to keep cleaning it, does everybody know what I mean? But now you're only 15,000 or something underneath it. So then that last one is a nice brand new sharp drill and you drop it down and pull it out. Side 
very even compared to what you might think, okay? Uh, I guess it has to do with people in the hand. My hands could never do that anymore because I they don't all work. You know, I, I did pretty well. I worked with uh, lots of tools and uh, table saws until you know I retired and I thought, oh, I'd like to make some bird houses. I thought that would be a good idea, so I had this old coconut that I brought up from the south where I lived in Florida in the wintertime. I said, I think I can make a coconut, but I need to be able to clean it if I'm making a birdhouse, so I thought I could just cut it freehand on a table saw. Mm -hmm. Except it caught all that stringy stuff, and this hand went right through it. Mm -hmm. Lucky I can do everything but play the guitar anymore. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, so be careful, you know, oh, what happens is, you know, I got so used to the tools and, and you're not thinking, you've always got to be respectful all the time, but they'll get you. You can see, I didn't have bubbles on it, some people used to put a bubble on it to keep the level, you just bubbles up here. <laughs> and we put uh, tuning pin bushings in. So what are tuning pin bushings for in a piano? Does anybody have a good idea? Center, At least I really don't have them. Oh, you think that's what it's for? That's because you're a piano tuner, right? <laughs> <laughs> all right, the real reason, there's two real reasons, okay? It does help with flagging out of all, but that's not the reason. <laughs> okay? That's where you see it, and it helps you, helps you with that. It's a little steady. The real reason for tuning pin bushings, truthfully, is in a factory, they put the bushings in first, and that's for a line where the thing is to keep the drill going straight so that it comes out at the right angle and don't drop. The second real reason, with the real mechanical reason for one, is not the flagging. If I took that, put those tuning pin bushings and I put one on each end and I drove a tuning pin into that plate, will you be able to get the plate off? Did you hear what I'm saying? If I take the plate and I put the plate down, right, and I drill it out and I put tuning pin bushings in and I put one tuning pin on this end and one tuning pin on this end, will you be able to pull that plate off? No, do it 250 times was it doing, shearing the panel plate to the, to the pin block or, or to the whole back and everything, really. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay, that's the mechanical part of what they're all about. Everybody got it that time. So now we got strings. This is what piano people do. You know, we know all about this, right? Holy cow! <laughs> got a little grizzly there. <laughs> David, you might know that. That was about the time, right? Right. That's where he learned that beard he's got, except <laughs> Mister and Greg. He used to have a beard to look like that. Uh, <laughs> black. They were black. <laughs> <laughs> you were there about then. Huh? Yeah. Was it? No. No, this, no. You would have been later, later, later than that. Yeah, this would have been 1979 or something like that. Okay. Steve Jowell always taught me this, right? Because he grew up, and Frank did, they grew up in the Depression. A little different attitude. Okay, so I had to build this piano out of one four by eight sheet of plywood. Can That was his thing. You couldn't waste anything. It had to be all figured out how to make every cut and do it. So you had to kind of think about it. And I did have a sketch one time you know, that I had gotten from him. But I, I couldn't remember a couple of things I had to keep trying. Because once you make the first cut and you screw up, you can't do it again. You almost need another panel. This panel is actually new kind of panel, okay? All upright panels are made out of, uh, the old ones are gonna be made out of uh, some kind of a Senecor or a poplar or something like that. And then two veneers and two veneers on, on each side of it, okay? So it's solid core panel. 
You can pass that around. If you take this, this is a real tight grain spruce. And this is a piece of a rib. Since I got all these toys here, I'll pass them around quick. Probably up in the 35 grains per inch deal. And you know, a lot of people, oh, the tighter the grain, they got to have in this outdoors and everything. And that's not true. Okay, it might look cool. But the soundboard, truthfully, the curve that I put in the soundboard with those, with the mechanical curve that I put in, you know, like shaping the ribs and you know, doing that, that's only part of what makes the soundboard. It really has to do with the drying down and then letting it take on humidity back to the natural, which is six to eight percent or thereabouts in the house. It could be way up in the you know, humidity we have right now in Florida. If you didn't control it. Okay, it is how that goes. Now, if you have to take this, you'll have trouble keeping a crown or building a crown in it with a real tight grain because when moisture goes not down the grain, it goes where? In between in the soft spot. So, you, you know, people used to ask me, well, my favorite number is around 12 or 14 grains per inch. You know, they, so I think I used to have a spec with Bill Duke actually, but we're out to you guys that would go 12 or 10 to 18 at the decimal or something like that. Uh, you start getting tighter than that, you're going to have a grain problem. Yeah, if it looks good to you, fine, but don't complain that the grain, you know, you couldn't do the crown. The sand, soundboard panels and, and pieces of stuff there, Come up and take a peek at it. You see it. Anyway, we lay out this panel and we're going to put this panel together. So let's go. She so that's all for the case for us. Case is cabinet. That's all cabinet. Okay. Yeah, this is all the cabinet. It's been a whole cabinet. It's got to be made out of this one sheet. Now, this is, you know, I didn't have a ton of money again to be doing this. Uh, and I, the cabinet wasn't that important to me to have a fancy Walmart cabinet or something like that. It come out and it looks really decent. You know, especially for that time, you know, pine cabinets, everybody had that and was that. So let's see what happens. So this is pine veneer and it's on a ply. Uh, five ply probably plywood and, and, a, and a veneer on the top. flip sides. So we got something that goes on the sides and I think this we can move along and not really building. Now, what I'm building there are the cheeks. They're going to come out of the piano and basically took two pieces to put together to make it thick enough. Cheeks, is that right? I know we call them cheek blocks. Are those the cheeks, right? Yeah. Cheeks are or something. Yeah. Am I okay with that? Yeah. Sure. You know what I mean. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then, you know, the piece that got cut out because that piece is around here. I can move it out one. Here is that piece, okay, they're cut, and that's how it was put together, and that's the kind of material. Anyway, we veneered it after we made a cut down, it kind of looked like a piano kind of thing, you know. All right, a little, a, a little press that does that. Okay, now I did have a blueprint. I don't see it, but there's a blueprint that tells me where the key bed height is going to be, okay? Um, and I, after I glue it, a lot of times they'll be just glued. You won't have screws in there also holding that. Uh, but that's glued and screwed. And a key bed, you've got to go on. The key bed is kind of easy. Pratt really gave it to me. It's all spruce, okay? It was laid up. I mean, I had to cut it to size or whatever. I didn't laminate it up. They were making some as a maybe about this time over there, so I had, I could get key bits, you know. And they might make me to the same people, I guess, but I'm part of it. And the same thing's gonna happen with the piano, and if I don't do this, that underneath here, Owen, underneath here, 
with screws, right? My grandson back here, the stand-up fellow, okay, Melanie's boy. He's he's actually hanging hammers and everything for the Melanie a couple of days a week now, and he did that. But he calls me up because he has a little moving thing. He has lots of things. He's a regular and drop in here. You know, he has painting crews. And I, I, so I think that I wanted to give him some money to make, basically go to college. So I told him, okay, if you paint the shops, it was the old shops, and fifteen hundred dollars or something. That I give you. You go. Plus, he just hires a crew, pays them five hundred, because the other. <laughs> but he, he, he's quite the young man, so he, he's cool. But anyway, he calls me up one time about eight o'clock at night, about three weeks ago. And he's got some piano. Where was it? In the basement or upstairs? An upright piano, and they want to bring it out, and it won't turn out. He's trying to take it all apart so he can bring it down the stairs. <laughs> and that was one of the, how do you get this off? <laughs> Did you get it off? Yeah, you got it off. Yeah. Anyway, what I'm going to tell you is, see screws here, there's going to be three screws normally on any upright, three, maybe four, and then we'll come across from the rear and come up to the chief. Not, it won't be glued usually. Okay, scratch my head to do what? Because what do we have to do now? Build an action. We have to figure out how to build an action and build a set of keys to make it put in. And that's what we're gonna, we make the keys from scratch. Wow. We're gonna make the action, not the action parts, but we have to build an action that's gonna fit that. So we have to take and have what's called a standard head scale, meaning the keys on the piano over here, okay, from one end to the other. That's a standard, this well, if it's called a standard head scale. That's basically though, so that if you go to play an octave, you're a pianist, if you went to another piano, it wasn't a different octave. Does everybody mean know what I mean by not a different octave, meaning a little longer or what? There are shorter than Frank Stoffel, who taught me almost all of the people, and Frank and Steve Dillon taught me most about building the piano, okay? Frank taught me about actions and keys. In Frank's job there, we talked about research and development and everything, but his real job, when I was, and I was being groomed for or why I needed, to, they wanted me to do this. You gotta understand the rest of the piano. Frank's job was, after a while, he did every job from on the line and everything, and then he did key work for people, and he worked on the line keys, and he was like, you know, he'd grab a handful of keys and say about seven keys in each hand, and he could literally throw them like that, and they go right down balance rail pins. Because he would, you know, that's what they're on production. That's what they do. You know, it'd be kind of like going through the Kimball factory and you're watching some girl that does 136 dampers, like piano, not 136. You know, does the dampers on 136 pianos a day. We don't do that, do we? But she, it would take her four weeks to tune the piano. <laughs> Frank's job was that it, it now nah, we're going three minutes over because we're going to come back and we're going to build an action area. But his job was to take and have to, uh, if, if you were going to build a piano, had a new piano and you wanted to buy actions and keys, you had to, a production level was 100. Okay, they wouldn't make. So Pratt, you had to go out and get all the measurements from the piano, like what, what, what maybe off of here, but there were certain measurements on Ellison, go see it, because Frank would actually prototype, make by hand, two, five sets of keys and five actions that would go together and they would be put in and any changes had to be made then before they set up the line. That was his real job, okay? Besides doing things with technicians and making keys and showing you all how to do that kind of stuff. All right, we're going to take a break, but that's the other half of the class, and Joyce has got some other half of very interesting information. Okay, we're on our way. Okay, guys, thanks. thanks.